Caption test one. Caption test two. Welcome to Archival Adventures. I hope that you can hear us. Um, also, there's a lovely light sitting right in in the way of the camera. Hi, Puddle Glum. Live on this channel? I know. Um, anyway, hi. We just I ran into some technical difficulties with the audio setup and. Um, getting the microphones to actually work. So uh, hopefully the audio levels are good. Let me know if they're not. Um, uh, I will be trying to fine tune um, a couple of things as we get going, but that's okay because today I have a guest. Uh, I have Archivist Bess here uh, and um, She's been working with the John Parsons papers, and so we get to learn from Bess about those papers and what's up with them. And um, so, yeah, hi, Hannah. Uh, so we're gonna move, roll along into that, so that I can get up and you know get a couple of things sort of tightened up and, and fixed. But first, as always. Um, <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monica people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, faculty, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive BT, the institutional and individual commitment to Eprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I typically start off with a peek at the finding aid if you okay. want to uh, yes. guide us. So this is a <laughs> preliminary finding aid that's currently available. Ooh, I'm too far over. Uh, this is a preliminary finding aid based on an initial uh, collection inventory that was done many years ago before the processing of the collection actually. If you look place. at the camera in front of you, yes. uh, they'll see it as you looking at them. Yes. <laughs> um, or if you look up at the screen <laughs> instead of. I, like, I get that you're looking at me, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, the music can be down, yes. I, I will adjust that. Thank you for that feedback. Also, happy birthday, Urban Bohemian. Uh, sorry. I probably shouldn't have just, like, screamed that out in chat, but I was excited. Uh, let me know if the balance is better. 
for the music and the um, microphones. Also, hi, Lord Portica. So uh, this finding aid is based on a preliminary uh, inventory of the collection that was done many years ago before any processing uh, took place on it. And so it doesn't reflect sort of the current status of this collection. Um, but it is a great jumping off point for sort of getting into the types of materials that are available within it. So one of the things that we typically use the finding aid for at the beginning is um, the biographical or historical note. Yeah. So if you want to give a little background on who is Parsons, why are his papers of interest? Of course. Um, so Parsons was born in 1913 in Michigan. He was the son of Swedish immigrants. Uh, their original name uh, when they moved here was Thorin. It's unclear uh, when or why they changed their name, whether that was done for them at Ellis Island, whether that was a choice that they made when they got here is unclear. Um, but Parsons, uh, the name was changed before John C. Parsons was born. Uh, his father ran, uh, his father was also an engineer and he started up a company creating uh, replacement car parts for Fords. Um, Just keep going. Yes. <laughs> so um, that's where he got his start in engineering and he really kind of took off from there. He was always known as kind of a, a quiet nerd before uh, nerd was really a category that people really thought about. Um, he started his own company after uh, working at his father's company for a few years. Um, and then the story really picks up in the 40s when his company uh, was contracted to produce munitions and aircraft for the Army and Navy during the war. Um, and one of the things that we'll see in the collection is that during wartime, the labor that was available to work in the factories changed dramatically. The types of materials that they were making changed enormously from what they had been previously manufacturing. And the increased demand called for a new way of thinking about manufacturing. And Parsons really took that ball and ran with it. Um, he invented a process along with his partner, Frank Stulen, uh, that was known as numerical control, which is the precursor to functionally all modern manufacturing. Um, so he was tremendously influential in that space. Um, many of you have probably heard of CNC machines. Um, so CNC stands for computer numerical control. And so it's the development of the numerical control technology that Parsons pioneered. Um, shortly after the war, he was removed from the presidency of his company because the development of numerical control had been so monumentally expensive that the company didn't want to do it anymore. They were out. So they give him the boot, um, but within a few years, the royalties and residuals for the technology that they had created, patented, and licensed started to roll in and they realized that this really was the technology of the future. Um, so they brought him back in as president and he was reinstated. He stayed as president until uh, the late 60s at which time he branched off to start uh, his own second company, the John T. Parsons Company, which he ran until the sort of mid to late 80s. Um, he was very involved in his community. He was very involved with his family. Um, he never stopped trying to innovate, as the collection demonstrates, um, to a greater or lesser degree of success, but his primary uh, claim to fame is as the inventor of numerical control. 
which I'll get into later awesome. with some of the materials. Uh, yeah, so if, uh, so we only have three boxes with us today from the collection. Um, those are uh, 191, 192, and 210, I believe. Yes, um, those will be renumbered. <laughs> um, that was an oversight that they are still those numbers. The collection uh, had been in the process of being sorted through by someone, and so there was a lot of empty space in a lot of the boxes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of condensing went on. The final collection is probably going to be uh, closer to about 205 boxes rather than the 250 um, that are currently reflected on the finding aid. Okay. Um, and the finding aid should be available, uh, the new and updated finding aid should be available next week. So that will have all of the updated and accurate information on it. Awesome. I'm, I'm moving things around because I realize I need to be on the other side of the screen because when we look towards one another, we're looking towards the outside of the screen. So just keep going. Yeah. And, and I'm just going to keep fixing tech things for a moment. No problem. <laughs> so the photo that we have here, I figured was a good place to start. It's the one that we put up as the kind of title card for this episode. And I think it's really interesting in a number of ways. So this photograph uh, was taken of the female employees of the Parsons Corporation in 1952. And uh, the majority of these employees had been with the company for at least five years at the time that this photo was taken. Um, so they were employed by the factory during World War II, many of them working in various positions throughout the company. And it's interesting that there are so many of them. Um, but what is also interesting is that the company saw fit to get them all together and take a picture. Um, and if you look at the back, this was not just a picture that was taken for their benefit. It has all of their names and uh, marital status and the information for the Parsons Company. So this was something that was intended for distribution of some kind. Um, it is unclear what the exact purpose of this photograph was, but it wasn't simply, you know, an employee photo for them to take home and reminisce about all their friends that they worked with at the company. This was, you know, potentially about PR. It was potentially about hiring. Um, it was potentially about attracting male <laughs> employees to come you know, admire all of their lovely female counterparts. It's unclear um, okay. what the purpose of this was, and I just think that's really interesting. That's, so what year was it? 52. 52. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I guess not terribly surprising that it's that many, but uh, like looking at it, I was, it's a significant, like female staff, given that it's like an engineering type firm. Yes, for a factory involved at this time primarily in musician or munitions development and uh, production, it does seem unusual that there would be so many women and why they felt the need to give all of their names um, and whether or not they were married is... is the, um, yeah, the marriage thing. That's, um, thank you, uh, Lord Portico, for dropping the historical terms note. Um, I'm going to drop that over here as well. Uh, yeah, because yeah, that is not necessarily unexpected, but also, like, looking back today, who cares whether they're married in this context? Like, yeah. from, like, a benefits standpoint for, like, employer-provided benefits or health care or things like that, Th that's when you need to know? Yes, not for <laughs> whatever the purpose of this photograph was. It was definitely not for like the accrual of benefits or you know for the well-being of these female staff members. Somehow I don't see how that could possibly be relevant. Um, so it's just something that I wanted to draw attention to from the start is that dealing with any collection you're going to see some things that are surprising, potentially in both directions. It's surprising how modern it seems, 
and surprising also how regressive it seems <laughs> for the time. Um, and this collection especially had a number of surprises that way where, uh, you know, there would be contradictory messaging on all kinds of things, um, be it gender, race, um, employment status. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, a real whirlwind <laughs> of contradictions, as mo most of these collections are because they are ultimately generated by people. Mm -hmm. And um, my aim here today is to try to highlight the very human elements of these collections and of these stories that can get lost in sort of the industrial overarching narrative of, you know, we're telling the story of numerical control, but ultimately the story of numerical control is the story of the people who developed and implemented it. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to reset this camera real quick because for some reason in the past couple months it has decided to not let me control it wow. after about an hour of being on and it's been on for an hour. How delightful. Um, so I'll be able to control the zoom here again in just a second but while we're doing that uh, since that's finally the last like tech thing I need to fix um, <clears throat> I didn't do an introduction of you beyond just saying what your name is. Oh, yes. Would you care to, you know, tell the viewers a little bit about what you do as an archivist and, and uh, what your job has been here and maybe if you know, like, what you'll be doing in the future? Of course. Um, so, I came to Virginia Tech in October of 2018, so it'll be five years in a few weeks. Um, I am a project archivist, so I was brought on initially to work on the papers of a defunct textile mill in Southwest Virginia. Um, and oops, wrong direction. Um, from there, I have been kept on on a project basis on a number of different collections um, of various sizes and descriptions. Um, in order to get them processed and ready for researchers to use. Collections can come in in any number of states uh, with any kind of media and um, ultimately the point of my job here is to get those collections as clean and easy to use for the researchers as possible. Um, you've, you've done a couple of really big collections. Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> The original collection that I was brought in on was about 150 banker boxes. Um, this collection obviously is about 200. Um, yeah, generally my collections have fallen between 100 and 200 boxes here, uh, which is significant. Um, so most of my projects have been year-long projects. Uh, the Parsons collection is part of a two-year grant-funded project. Um, funded by NHPRC, which is the National Historic Preservation of Records Council, I believe. <laughs> Something like that. Um, awesome. So we have been engaged in that project for the past year. There's another year on the end of it. Um, unfortunately, I will be leaving in a few weeks uh, for a new adventure. <laughs> Um, but we like adventure here. Yes, that's sort of the name of the show. <laughs> um, but uh, a new archivist will be brought in to uh, handle the remainder of this project and you know bring it to a satisfying conclusion. Awesome. Um, so this picture um, might not look like much, but it is my favorite picture in the whole collection because it is the first time that we see a person of color and a woman working on the factory floor. And they just so happen to be together. So up front we have this gentleman. Um, they're assembling bomb fins. So it's the part on the bottom of the bomb that allows it to be controlled directionally. And then over here on the side, we have these two women um, also working on 
the exact same part at the exact same time, doing the exact same job, um, along with several white men as well. So um, this picture was taken during the war. Uh, there were labor shortages and many factories had to alter their hiring practices in order to keep up. You know, demand was increasing, staff was decreasing, the previously established mores could not stand. And so this is really a remarkable demonstration of the way that societal values were changing at this time. And, you know, things that would have been thought absolutely impossible, you know, three years beforehand, now were necessary and patriotic and laudable. So this assembly line <clears throat> is, it's not automated, is it? No. Okay. Um, like it's not, like those aren't moving through, those are stationary while they're working on them? Yes, those are just basically hooks that the bomb assembly, the fin assembly hung from so that they could be screwed together. Because what struck me in the picture, after, aside from two women over here and, and, and the black men there uh, that you pointed out was the clothes they're wearing yes. that seem entirely inappropriate for factory work. But if everything is stationary, they make more sense. Yes. Um, this was prior to the large-scale implementation of uh, extensive automated assembly. Um, part of that would come in through numerical control, but at this time, you know, there was a machine that stamped out the part and then it was all assembled by hand. And um, I imagine if it were a more elaborate assembly, it would have more of an assembly line aspect to it, but mm -hmm. because it's just, you know, stick these parts together, that's the way that they did it. And you can see over here in the corner, this man, obviously wearing a suit, uh, he was not a floor employee, that was a supervisor who was there to kind of watch over the work well, being done. But like the guy here, he's basically wearing a suit, he's got the shirt, he's got a vest, yes. and it looks like he's wearing a tie. Yes, um, so that would be an engineer Ah, okay. who was on the floor responsible for quality control essentially. Okay. So um, he was basically coming in and doing spot checks on these materials to make sure that everything was up to scratch. And then the women also look more dressed up than either of the two here. But I, I'm not certain if that's just like... I think that probably had more to do with women's fashion yeah. of the time <laughs> than um, the vicissitudes of the job. Yeah, no, it was just, the, the clothes stuck out to me. Yes, uh, <laughs> certainly, I mean, you can see this man here is wearing some gloves. Mm -hmm. He also appears to be wearing some kind of gloves. Um, it's unclear what exactly these two women over here are doing, but they're definitely handling a uh, fin assembly over here. So it could be that they're transporting it to a different part of the factory for further work. It could be they're doing some kind of inspection on it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's really an interesting image. Yes, it, it's why it's my favorite in the collection. When I saw it, I was struck by it very immediately. Um, these factories are located in Detroit, in Michigan. So obviously there is a large black population there. Um, they have a significant pool of employees to pull from, but they're competing with the automotive manufacturers, oh, excuse me, um, and the other manufacturing industries in the area. So, you know, it's possible that they wanted to be pickier <laughs> than they could be just based on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, but later on, we'll see um, there is a letter in the collection. I couldn't bring it today to show because it's currently in an exhibit downstairs. Um, I don't usually talk this much. <laughs> I understand. Um, but it's a letter from John T. Parsons to his congressman 
uh, basically demanding action on civil rights legislation in the 60s, saying like, these are my employees, they are afraid to come to work, like they are uncertain in their homes, we need civil rights legislation yesterday because like my factory has to run and I need these people to run it. And you know, is that the best justification for civil rights legislation? Obviously not. Um, <laughs> that's kind of a capitalist <laughs> uh, justification for civil rights. But at the same time, there were plenty of capitalists who were not advocating for civil rights legislation because that meant that they could continue to take advantage of people who didn't have any better options. It, it, it might not be the best reason, but it is probably the one that's most likely to sway the politicians that he was trying to convince. Yes, and uh, <laughs> we don't really have much of his personal writings, it's unclear how much he felt um, personally uh, the need for civil rights legislation. Like, I don't know if this was an argument that he was making because that's what his audience needed to hear to make it happen, or whether uh, that was the argument that he was making because that's honestly how he felt about it. It's unclear. Lord Portico. <laughs> In this case, we're saying that capitalism did a good. <laughs> well, it, it, it did a better than it needed to. It's usually capitalism's fault, but, but this time it encouraged movement in the right direction. Yes, and um, <laughs> that is one of the remarkable things about John T. Parsons as a person. He was a very kind of stereotypical nerd. Um, he was a brilliant engineer, obviously. He was very particular about many things. A lot of people who worked with him will say like he was exacting and very difficult to work with because of that. Um, not a lot of room for flexibility. And uh, you'll see as we move through various aspects of the collection that he really did keep his fingers in a lot of pies. Um, and yes, um, he does mention in the letter uh, something that gives a little bit of insight into his psyche at the time when he was writing to his congressman. That like, obviously this legislation is not enough, but we need something. Um, so he very much recognized that the Civil Rights Act as it stood was not the perfect legislation to deal with this issue, but that it was better than nothing and uh, something had to be done. So he definitely wasn't, you know, a doughy-eyed optimist about the, uh, <coughs> the, the ramifications of this particular set of legislation. Um, okay. Uh, it's easy to lose track of time while doing this because everything is so interesting. Should we yeah, move on to, move to on. another item? We've got plenty. Um, I have a few photographs. We don't have to linger on these very long, but I just think that they're interesting. I can zoom out if you want them both sure. in the shot. Upside down. Um, I typically have have encouraged um, viewers to think about gloves when we're looking at glossy photos. These have edges, and so as long as we're touching the edges, we're probably okay, but I do have a pair of gloves if you want. Okay. <laughs> this is the only time, like, when we're doing with paper and stuff like that, I don't really yeah. say much about uh, gloves other than um, we tend to not use them for paper items here, uh, but every archives is going to be different. But we tend to try and use them for glossies. So. I can put on <laughs> gloves, don't worry about it. Um, so here we have two different uh, bomb assembly stages that Parsons would have been involved in. Um, these are kind of the tail 
region and those fins uh, back here is just a stack of the punched out components. Um, and you can see they made thousands and thousands and thousands of these bombs. This was not a sideline. This was what they did during the war. Um, all day, every day, just making bombs. Um, they teamed up with several different companies, including uh, Chrysler. So a lot of these are like Chrysler branded <laughs> in a very fun way <laughs> for a bomb um, that you would not expect. But here you can see the actual explosive portion of the bomb. They made the housings for the bombs, but not the innards. So they did not make the explosive part, they just made the shell that then they passed along to others who built out the interior of this uh, bomb. So you can see here is a fully assembled uh, tail piece and it would fit onto this post and there's a little screw at the bottom that would hold it all together. Um, and so this is a lot of what they did during the war. It's a very familiar shape. Yes. Like, it is like a cartoon bomb. Yeah. But I never thought about who was building them and that they would have a brand name on them. Yes. Um, and they partnered with several different companies over the years to build them. So you'll see, um, like, these are the Chrysler ones. These are the, you know, whoever else. Well, and Chrysler also, just surprising to me, I would have expected something like Lockheed or Martin or... They do work a lot with Lockheed Martin. Yeah. Um, or Boeing even, like th those were kind of like the big three that I would have thought of. Uh, there are probably some others, but I would have to dig into the aerospace stuff to remember names. Um, also, uh, Lord Portico did suggest a self-care if, if you need a self-care, uh, which is just generally like stretching, running to go grab water if you need it, uh, things like that. Oh, so. Thank you. <laughs> A lot of factories got retooled during the war to make munitions, yes. Yes, uh, and this was definitely one of them. Um, so one of the major sort of advancements that Parsons made was they were contracted to produce uh, helicopter blades and airplane propeller blades for uh, wartime aircraft. And the way that they uh, achieved this contract the way that they obtained it was because they were in the process of implementing numerical control in their factory. Um, and it was truly uh, one of those innovations that revolutionizes the whole face of the industry. It's, it's really difficult to uh, overestimate the impact that this had on manufacturing. Here are a few men posing with the 10,000th uh, bell blade, which is what this particular part is called, uh, that was produced. And you can see and their little Parsons logo. Yeah, I was, I got a little bookmark out to point with. <laughs> oh. um, and yeah, they, they slapped that bad boy and everything. <laughs> um, but the reason why numerical control was such an innovation is because prior to this, um, all parts were made from molds or they were hand made by artisans essentially which meant that one part or the same part across multiple uh, manufacturing time periods would not necessarily fit in every plane or in every helicopter there was variation because it was all sort of bespoke, hand-built. They would build the helicopter, and mm -hmm. then if a part broke, you would have to rebuild that part for that helicopter or for that airplane. Um, so uh, Ford, with the Model T, gave us the assembly line. Yes. And this gave us sort of interchangeable parts because of uniformity of construction. Yes, um, and it also allowed for much more complex modeling of your finished part um, because you could basically, using uh, numerical 
control. You're basically uh, creating the design mathematically and numerically and then executing that as opposed to a guy getting in there who knows what it's supposed to look like and just doing it by hand. Um, so the manufacturing took place more and more by machine rather than by human hands in this context, which obviously now we've you know, moved on to fully robotic. It is like ProtoCAD, and I'll show you uh, some of the um, some of the uh, drawings and plans that they had, it becomes much more clear that that's exactly what's going on. Is they're allowing for the precise design and engineering of these parts, which was not at all possible with any other previously existing method, um, which is how they got this contract. They could go to the army and say, we can make you a hundred identical helicopters. And if a part breaks, you'll be able to take that same part and just stick it in. Um, so it's infinitely replicable, and it's much, much faster than having every piece done individually. Consilience, uh, I was actually like starting to search for the connections between CAD and uh, CNC, because I had the same thought that it, it reminded me of like computer-aided drafting and like the precision design of, of items. Yeah. Also, um, just talking about if a part fails and you, you can just take the new one and slot it in. Um, as always, my brain goes to Star Trek and uh, Star Trek Voyager had a whole episode about uh, um, interchangeable parts with a uh, android species. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, this is the very beginning of that, um, and obviously it changed the face of labor within the factory um, because it was a lot more plug and play. You didn't necessarily need to have the same set of skills mm -hmm. in order to effectively create and assemble these parts, which meant that they could work with a much wider pool of employees and the uh, basically on-ramp for those employees. There was a lot less training. It was a lot less time and energy intensive, um, but it did also kind of downgrade the pay and skills level for those employees. There was a lot less room for, you know, economic mm -hmm. uh, moving up because it required a lot less of those employees um, in terms of training and in terms of knowledge and skill. It would open up automation in the in the manufacturing process and then the employees become more uh, monitored the machines or do quality control. Uh, yes. And my brain as we're talking keeps going to like the old uh, TV series how it's made mm -hmm. and and just seeing the inside of uh, factories in operation uh, and just considering like hand making bespoke products and the transition to that. Yes. Um, huh. So if you imagine the amount of time that it would take to handcraft 10,000 identical helicopter blades versus the, I think this was Let's see. They don't have a date on it, um, so it's unclear how long it took them to manufacture those 10,000s, but it was certainly much faster than if they had had to do it all uh, just with whatever employees hadn't been sent to the war. Wow. This is something I had never even considered. Like. I, I had never thought of what enabled the transition to automation. Yeah, um, there was, a, it was kind of a simultaneous push and pull because there was the war on mm -hmm. and so there were just a lot fewer men around to
to do these jobs. So automating was a way to balance that by requiring fewer man hours to do any particular task. Mm -hmm. But once that automation started, they realized, oh, this is a lot cheaper. This is a lot easier. This is a lot better. Um, so moving away from the war, because that's a bit of a heavy topic, uh, Parsons uh, really tried their hand at a lot of things, and not all of those things were successful. So here we can see uh, one of their flop products. Uh, they tried making boats for a while. It sank? Uh, yeah, they were not good boats. Oh dear. Uh, they were incredibly expensive to build. They uh, were kind of styled to look a bit like the Cadillacs of the time. Um, but they were extremely expensive. They were very impractical. Nobody wanted them. Um, and they did not float the way that you might hope uh, a boat would, typically. Generally, generally helpful if boats float. Yes. Um, <laughs> there are only two promotional photos that I can find for these boats that actually were taken on the water. The rest were in uh, studios like this one. Um, so they only tried to uh, be in the boat business for a few years. They gave up uh, pretty quickly and sold the name and designs to another company, which I believe is still op in operation in Florida, um, but obviously not making the same boat. Not making Cadillacs that float on water? Uh, Cadillacs <clears throat> that intermittently float. <laughs> I mean, I, there are definitely car manufacturers that made cars that intermittently float. Sure. Um, I would say that this is about the same. Closer, yeah, to that. <laughs> um, but, you know, just he, he wasn't always a perfect engineer and innovator oh. in the field. But somebody who's an inventor has to have some things that don't work. Exactly. You know, he was trying new things, he was innovating. It's. Uh, just talking about um, numerical control earlier reminded me that we our first episode of 2023 back in on January 4th we were looking at the Joe Miller collection and he um, he was the first to implement barcode scanning for retail oh very nice and so we were looking at that back in January uh, and it's just some of those things we take for granted today. I uh, just yeah, it, totally changed the way. So that if anybody's sense. interested in that one, it's on the YouTube, uh, the library's YouTube channel. Um, it's the first episode of 2023. Oh. So um, we've been around a tiny bit. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So this is. Um, Another favorite part of the collection for me, uh, this is an ad that they produced for the Pure Air Kitchen System, which is yet another product that they made. Uh, they made it from the mid-20s uh, through the 50s. You'll be able to see, just based on the images, that they are very 50s. <laughs> I love uh, mid-century advertisements like this. Oh, They're yeah. always They're fun. They're stunning. Um, <laughs> so, the basic premise of this is this closet that you see back here is the kitchen. Um, and it was a modular closet kitchen system that you could buy and install. It's like a Murphy kitchen. Yes, it is a Murphy kitchen. Um, and it had its own uh, captured air circulation system so that while you were cooking, you can close the doors and the cooking smells won't get into your house. I have a concern about heat. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my first thought. I have a, I have a concern about heat um, uh, with closing the doors, but okay. Um, but yeah, you can see from the picture, they've got a little fridge, they've got a I imagine pop. they insulated with asbestos. Very likely, yeah. Um, that would make sense to me, <laughs> but 
yeah, the idea was you could have your whole kitchen in this little cupboard. It was great for a small family, for a small house where you didn't want to have a whole room. I mean, it, it would be perfect for like tiny house. Yes, um, and when you're done, you can just close those cupboard doors and have this, you know, attractive cabinet system um, and keep all of those cooking smells contained. Mm -hmm. Um, so there were various sizes and shapes of these modular systems that oh, you I like, could choose from. I, I like this image because it actually looks like... It's in a house. A picture. Yeah. It's not an illustration where the others were illustrations. Mm-hmm. Um, and these were relatively popular. Um, it was sort of considered the kitchen of the future in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it was playing on that, you know, sort of busy housewife, what do we, what do, we do? We need to modernize the, the way that we wife uh, <laughs> to improve the lives of Just waiting our for Rosie to roll on out. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Sorry. You know, Jetson's referenced that, and also if, if anybody watching is not familiar uh, when I said Murphy Kitchen, um, that's a reference to a Murphy bed, which was a bed that lifts up and, and just hides away in the wall. And yes. so it looks looks like a closet door or something. And, uh, yeah, you just like pull a latch and the bed comes yeah. down. I have to remember to explain references because not everybody <laughs> knows. <laughs> Um, so you can see here they have four models currently to choose from, and within that you could customize um, based on your own layout. Uh, let's zoom in on the models and yeah. see yeah, if we can see some differences. Um, so here these two have no uh, fridge uh -huh. underneath. I believe there is a gas and electric model of each. So I think it's uh, Got it. fridge, electric, and gas, no fridge, electric, and gas. Well, and they have something different with the range. So uh, if you look at the controls above the fridge uh, on that side, there's two different control schemes. Yeah, I imagine that's also for electric versus gas. Ah, that would make sense. Um, and up here, this is like a little oven. So I imagine these are if you already have a full-size fridge. Mm -hmm. If you've got a bigger family, you don't want to go shopping every day. This little dinky fridge isn't going to cut it. You know, maybe your husband is a big beer drinker. Who knows? Um, you don't need the fridge, so you just get a little bit of extra storage on these two options. What is in the lower right cabinet and the two with the fridge? Um, that appears to be the compressor for the ah, refrigerator. Okay. So you lose a little bit of storage. Three pieces of, of cabinet yes. by having the, the mini fridge. Yes, but if you're you know a single person, you don't eat that much. Yeah. No, I was just it, it, I noticed there was something there and wondered what it was. Yes. Uh, from <clears throat> over here, it looks like a stack of cake tins, but I do believe it yeah. is the fridge compressor. <laughs> Interesting. And you know you can see here for any remodeling and modernization. Uh, sorry, I'm zoomed back out. That down. There we go. <laughs> for apartments or income units, and an income unit was basically like uh, low-income housing today, okay. where it was uh, for people who made less money, and it was restricted to like under a certain income amount. Um, so like people. rent control. Um, well, no. It was, no. Okay. It was. Um, more like if you were on a pension or a social security, then you could rent one of these I units okay. um, that was, you know, prorated based on your income, basically. Um, and here you can see a diagram breaking down the sizes and the various components of your kitchen in a closet. The complete ultra-modern all-metal packaged kitchen. And <coughs> if you bought one of these, you only had to buy one thing. You didn't have to pick a sink and a faucet and a stove and an oven and a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. You could just buy this thing and stick it in a closet 
and you would have a kitchen. So whenever you plan, keep pure air in mind. Yeah, pure air. Pure, pure air in mind. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I love these ads, they're yes. fun. So I just thought this one was fun. This is the development team that was responsible for the Pure Air Kitchen. Pure Air. Um, just a bunch of middle-aged white guys. <laughs> yep. Making kitchens Dark for suits. their Mostly. wives. Uh, I doubt <laughs> that many of these men probably cooked <laughs> ever, potentially. Um, there's every likelihood that none of them really had any idea, idea what to do in a kitchen at all. Um, so I just thought that this was funny. This was the picture that they took to be like, here are all the guys who developed this thing. Like, do they know what is needful in a kitchen? Unclear. But comparing, they made that, one. comparing that to the image we started with, yes. um, which was significantly more uh, women. Um, ooh, and we are um, getting a raid from 16-Bit Eric. Uh, welcome in everybody from 16-Bit uh, Eric's channel. Eric, I hope that the rest of your stream went well. Um, welcome everybody to <clears throat> Wednesday over here. Um, this is Archival Adventures. If you're new here and haven't joined before, um, I, uh, I I am Anthony Wright, De Hernandez Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, uh, also known in the Twitchiverse as Rogan27. Um, and joining me today is uh, Archivist Bess, uh, who is one of my co-workers here in Special Collections. Um, <clears throat> we are looking today at the John T. Parsons papers, uh, and Parsons was an engineer and an inventor, and um, he created numerical control, which is known today as computer numerical control, and is a method of controlling machinery, various things. Um, via computer programming. So if you're giving instructions to your 3D printer, you're probably using CNC. Um, and indeed, if anybody was here and is not already following 16-Bit uh, Eric, I do recommend uh, following 16-Bit Eric. His channel is a wonderful place to hang out. Um, he is a wonderful, wonderful person, great storyteller. Um, you will not regret following. Um, and. Uh, Hi, Baba Yiha, welcome. It's good to see you and uh, welcome in everybody else. Feel free to, to jump in with uh, commentary or questions as they come up as we continue to explore. Yeah. Um, so just because I love the pure kitchens, I want one very badly in my own home. I think that they're adorable and hilarious. Um, so here's another advertisement that was made for the pure kitchen system a few years later. As you can see, this one's a little bigger. Um, they yeah. took some input and somebody was like, this is great, but where do I put my stuff and also my things? Uh-huh, stuff and things, yeah. Um, and so you can see uh, here is one purportedly in action. It's got this drawer that pulls out that she's got um, some bowls and plates resting on there I'm in. in front of the range. Um, so it's got like a little inbuilt counter mm -hmm. that you pull out. It's just a drawer that you can rest things on, which was a new innovation. It reminds me of two things. It reminds me of uh, galley kitchens in like apartments where um, the kitchen basically sits in a hallway. Yes. Um, it also makes me think of, um, <clears throat> I don't know why, it makes me think of like a kitchen on a train. If, if you were gonna put a kitchen in like a little like suite on a train for somebody, this is what it would be. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of an efficiency kitchen uh, that I had once, except that kitchen did not have a range or an oven. It was just like a microwave and a sink and a toaster, basically like in a closet <laughs> with an outlet so you could plug in your hot plate or whatever. I think I can zoom you back in by one. Um, <laughs> so. Okay. Ah, perfect. <laughs> um, so once again, we have the, the pure air system. Up here, we've got the oven. We've got some shelves. Here is our sink. Here are these two drawers that pull out for a little bit of counter space. There's this shelf that folds down off the door, so you've got another place to put things, like mm -hmm. if you take a pot off the hob. Um, a slightly larger fridge um, with 
a little freezer back inside of it. And then if this door was open, you'd be able to see that the compressor is in there. And it's also got this additional storage, cabinetry, all along the sides there. Yeah, like a full pantry now. Yes. So they were they were innovating. Um, and uh, oh, what's the word? Um, I forget what the word is, but basically they were... Incremental improvements. Yeah. They were taking in uh, commentary and adjusting. Um, and so this is the last pure air thing I think I'll show you. Um, but this is uh, one of the early sort of design sketches for uh, what they wanted this pure air kitchen to look like. So this is just... Somebody had this idea, knocked up this sketch. Um, you can see that they uh, made it based on the specifications of this GE HES refrigerator and this GE G5A8 range. So they just took commercially available uh, kitchen equipment that they could get specs for in order to figure out sort of what kind of dimensions they would need and how this system would work. And um, I love the sort of hand-drawn um, aspects of this collection. We're gonna get to uh, more of those with some of the larger items. Um, but it really uh, brings you back to that human element of like a, a person thought of this, a person wrote this down and designed this and thought this up. And then, you know, we get to the, the implementation. So I just think that's real cool. Yeah. I love that we have the original, like, sketch. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's like, oh, we're going to need an outlet. Like, maybe we want a toaster here. I don't know. Uh, here's a little produce basket that didn't end up making it in, but that's fine. You know, this is just a, a somebody kind of planning out what they want. So I just think that's nice. Alrighty. I think it's cool. Ooh, B Zelda, thank you for the follow. I should probably have planned a little better, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, planning on this show? Yeah. Uh, that's not what this show is about. This show is mostly, like it's rare to have somebody who knows so much about the materials. Mm -hmm. Typically this show is essentially an unboxing of archival items where okay. I'm seeing things for the first time at the same time that the viewers are seeing them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're getting my reaction and my guesses as to what stuff means and uh, if we find something interesting, we look at it together and, and see what we can figure out and learn. All right. Well, so. I'm happy to be able to <laughs> ramble wildly about uh, old-timey kitchen systems. Yeah. Um, it's, it's perfectly welcome. Yeah. So I did tell a lie. There is more pure stuff because, again, it is the coolest part of the collection. Um, so here we have the machinery that was responsible for actually, like, stamping out and creating the metal pieces that would be turned into this kitchen system. So here you can see all the sinks and they're just all stacked up and this is just a big, basically it's a heavy machine. It's a machine that is heavy. And they <laughs> put in the sheet of metal and they squish it and it comes out in a sink shape. I can zoom in. We might have to shift the, yeah, but fine. so we can see some detail in the picture. Yeah, and so you can see here are some gents. They're taking some uh, formed sinks out of this press mold and putting them down here on these stacks with all of their friends. Um, and those will go on to be installed into this pure kitchen system later on. You can see they've got all these extra flaps that will be kind of folded and bent into the origami shape that is necessary for these kitchens. Um, it is a lot of sinks, Puddle Club. Yes. <laughs> uh, this was a very popular product that they made for, you know, 20 odd years. It's um, interesting that I've never seen one in person then. Like yes. if it was that popular that they were just, 
uh, they Did were, they not survive to today? They don't. Um, there are a few in museums uh, in various places. There's, as far as I know, there are only two like fully functional remaining pure air units. Um, hmm. And they're in museum settings. But yeah, these kitchens were largely replaced as people realized that if you weren't like a single person, then it wasn't the most efficient system. If you also had to have a separate fridge, you know, if you've only got two little hobs, you know, you can't cook a dinner for six that easily in this tiny oven. Um, so it was very much a uh, a novelty for a little while. It was like this ultra modern kitchen, and then people realized, like, oh, actually, the old kitchen was good, though. We like the old kitchen. <laughs> and so a lot of people had theirs taken out and replaced with a more standard kitchen. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate not that many of these exist anymore in the electric or in the gas. Um, <clears throat> I, I am Puddle Glum asked if they don't end up using the sinks, does the business consider those to be sunk costs? <laughs> because puns. Indeed. Also, high shadows of life. Um, so here is another set of machinery. I just love kind of the intensity of the operation to create something that seems, again, kind of like a novelty. Um, they have this whole factory set up, um, you know, rolling out and punching, and you can see the machine is doing relatively little here. It's just uh, basically to punch out those holes, and this is the back panel of the kitchen system. So those holes are where the electrics and the plumbing come through, um, and like the, this whole range of machines here is just to produce these back panels. So um, as far as replicability and, and uniformity. It was high in this particular instance because they had this dedicated machine. Right. That could create this one thing and each of them is exactly the same. So they don't need numerical control for replicability here because they have the one machine that just stamps out the same holes in this in every sheet. Yes. Okay. Um, so if this was the way that uh, manufacturing continued where it was, you know, each individual process had its own individual machine that was then hand finished later by a guy, um, that would have been fine. But obviously when you're making 15 different kinds of helicopter, and you need, you know, 20 different styles of blades because they made out of, um, you know, they made these blades out of every conceivable type of material. They tried everything. They did wood. They did. So they needed to be able to just retool machines a lot faster than, like, that was a machine built to purpose. Exactly. But retooling it wouldn't have really. They could have, you know, remade the machine. Um, Basically, it's just got like a roller punch right. in there. <clears throat> and so they could have remade that roller to punch a different series of holes. It would have just been a lot more in labor intensive and yeah, and inefficient. Yeah, it, the, there's not as much point there. Um, so kind of the bread and butter for a long time of the, oh, that's two pictures, of the Parsons Corporation was these helicopter blades because they were the only ones who could make them. Um, and so here are some high mucky mucks in the Parsons Corporation uh, hanging out with this fine military gentleman showing off their brand new Cheyenne helicopter that they just delivered. Uh, do you know the year? Do I know who those are? The year. Uh, I do not know the year on that one. I'm just, the Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne attack helicopter developed by Lockheed for the United States Army. 
I'm looking to see. First flight was 1967. All right. So Only is... 10 were built. Mm. Well, it was made with lace. <laughs> and we've got a picture of one of them. Um, and you can see there are some, you know, probably reporters uh -huh. climbing around, looking in it. Um, here is a prototype for a different style of helicopter, and you can see it's got this ring propeller system at the back there. It looks very it futuristic. It does look like a helicopter. It says airplane fuselage, but it looks it looks more like a helicopter. Um, did I say? So here is the oh. uh, here is the design, the design drawing? sketch for what they wanted this aircraft to look like. So definitely, it looks, it, yeah, it's not a helicopter. It looks like a, I'm looking at the struts, mm -hmm. and uh, they appear to have tiny wheels on the back, but they're definitely like water landing skis. They do look like that. Yeah, I'm not sure whether this particular aircraft was ever brought into production. Um, I, like this might have just been a prototype proof of concept kind yeah. of thing and they got some guys to sit in it and they were like, eh, maybe not this one. I don't know. Um, I, I don't have any records of like completed ones of this particular aircraft. I um, know I've seen things with sort of those lines. I can't remember if I've seen anything with a giant... It reminds uh, me of those like uh, swamp boats. Yes. That I was thinking the same thing. And I can't, I just can't remember if anything, we have a collection of um, like airplane advertisements and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, um, that we've looked through on stream before. Um, we actually have a couple of collections with that sort of material in them. And we've got a collection of stuff from a guy that was a test pilot during this time uh, and later an FAA investigator. And so there's a lot of stuff from weird aircraft like this, because he was a test pilot. But I can't remember seeing anything with that sort of engine on it. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's unusual. It was definitely, um, it seems like it was somebody's like, what if we could do this cool thing? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, I don't know, make a prototype, we'll see how it goes. Um, it looks like they just took the, the front propeller from a, uh, like a propeller plane. Mm -hmm flipped it around and stuck it on the back. I mean, for all I know, that's what they did. <laughs> I'm not an engineer. Um, I just play one on TV. <laughs> um, so here we can see these are some uh, Ooh, sepia. employees finishing a wood helicopter blade. Um, and you can see here he's got a, a form that he's running over this blade to make sure that it conforms to, you know, the final shape that they need for this particular item. So quality control. Yes. Um, and uh, each blade was sort of precision honed. You can see this guy back here is also doing some checks on the other end of this blade. It's clamped in. Um, this is a wood blade. It would have been like a laminate product, so it wouldn't have been one solid piece of wood, it would have been uh, layers of wood uh, all stuck together and affixed so that it had uh, more flexibility and strength. Um, the issue with that is it was a more involved process mm -hmm. um, than just, you know, shaving down a single piece of wood. So. Uh, while numerical control did take over a lot of the manual aspects of the work, there was still a lot of uh, human eye and know-how that had to go into the final product. It just sped things up a lot. And obviously now um, a lot of QA, QC type stuff is done uh, electronically, but this was really the precursor to that. Yeah. I imagine this would be all lasers Yeah. now it would be all lasers because lasers now are better than human eyes, but at the time, um, here's just a, another quick uh, wing. 
yeah, this is another uh, product that they made. Um, they did all kinds of things. Again, in the exhibit that's downstairs right now, uh, we have a cross-section for an extendable submarine uh, prototype that they uh, proposed to the Navy. It's unclear whether they actually ever made uh, that submarine, but he, he really tried to branch into all things. Uh, let's see. So we have a, all right, we about can... 20 minutes left if you want to. Yeah, let's move into the poster. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, the, the posters that I'm about to show you really, for me, reflect a lot of that uh, human element um, that's involved in... Uh, I will prepare to zoom out. Yes, these <laughs> manufacturing processes. This one, we're probably... We can wait on that one. That one's a little big. Um, oh, we can go... We can, we can do big. I can... Well, I want to do this one first. So... When you are developing a new technology, you have to develop every part of that new technology. And so this is a mock-up of what the uh, numerical control machine controls were going to look like. And so this is, um, at the time, computers were uh, punch cards. They were controlled and programmed via punch cards. And so this was basically uh, the input keyboard that you would use to create the punch tape mm -hmm. that would then be fed into the computer to translate that design. Um, and yeah, I, we've seen some um, uh, instruction manuals for actual like punch card programming machines. Yeah, uh, we've, we've looked at some of those in the past on stream. So they um, they developed their own machine uh, to take in and interpret uh, this punch tape. And what I love most about these... Sorry. I, I love this. It's great. I just love the hand-drawn design, uh, concept design for early technology, like, technology under development, especially like mid-century. This is my jam. I like this. Yeah. Um, so this is... Hi, Blue Rooster. This is their uh, sort of... Uh, they called this uh, product par tape. And so this was the second iteration of their par tape drafting table. And so uh, this table would fold out or it could fold up if you wanted to store it um, securely. You can see it, it wasn't affixed to anything. You could wheel it around. So this um, is definitely like pre-CAD. Oh, is, yeah. This is like moving towards computer-aided drafting. Yes, and you can I see zoomed in, but the, I'm gonna just uh, shift the control keyboard here that this was a prototype or a mock-up of that they would use to input the values that they needed. And um, this machine up here would then draw it for you. Oh, that's awesome. So you could say, all right, it needs to go like 15 degrees over four inches to get this angle that we need. And so this is the technology that they developed, which allowed them to create the complex curvatures needed by modern helicopters. There are, um, <clears throat> uh, there are very user-friendly um, animation softwares that do something similar today. Um, so I think that this is really valuable because not only does it demonstrate sort of the technological innovations, but it also in kind of a more sentimental way uh, shows how involved the human eye and hand still needs to be in this process at this time because they had to commission a human artist to draw this. Um, gorgeous. This is like, this could go in a frame and just... Yeah, I love these. There's, yeah. There are so many of these in the collection and it's always a treat uh, when one pops up because it is, 
I mean, it's industrial art. It is art made for the purposes of manufacturing and advertisement, but it is so lovely. Um, and, you know, if you, you know, consider that it used to be this enormous, I mean, 24 inches deep by 64 inches or 100 inches wide. So it used to take up, you know, a significant portion of a room. And now it's a program that you can get on your computer, which also does, you know, 25 other things. Um, but this was the first step in that process. Let's see what next, what next? This is really cool. I like it. Um, so this one I brought, and I don't know that we're gonna be able to get the whole thing in at once, but that's okay. Uh, all right, that's as far out as I can zoom. All right, let's so. see. Yeah, we can get most of it. I can also zoom in and we can take it in, in portions. That's uh, fine. If, um, it, how, whatever works. Yeah, there's no particular part of this one that's particularly important. I just think um, of interest is they made a lot of these posters for various purposes. Um, this one was likely to demonstrate to potential clients why their way was the best way. Um, and how using numerical control, they could create these very minute differences in the machining of the propeller, which would affect its function deeply. And they could say, you know, if we do it in this way, then we'll get this particular effect. If we do it in this way, we get this particular effect. And, you know, our way is the best way to do it, to get the best effect for these propellers. But I'm just trying to get this. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Um, but again, somebody drew this. Like somebody came in with a marker and made this poster um, that was then used in some kind of probably client presentation. Um, I I also um, <clears throat> I'm just going to call out to Lord Portico. Um, here at the bottom, there's a stamp. Uh, that I'm going to try and zoom in yeah, so that we can get it on screen. We might have to like... Scoot that up a little and it's fine. <clears throat> there we go. These data are submitted in confidence. The engineering design specifications and processes here shown are the exclusive property of the John T. Parsons Company, patent and copyrights reserved. Um, <clears throat> Lord Portico is... Um, <laughs> Lord Portico is a lawyer uh, who deals, knows quite a bit about um, patent and copyright. So I just thought I would point out the stamp <laughs> in the bottom. I mean, we're rebels. What can I say? <laughs> um, it has all been uh, donated to the archives. Um, and we have documentation uh, granting us ownership of it. So it's no longer confidential. Just like the top secret things that I've shared on stream. Yes. Um. <laughs> These were also most likely made um, probably between the 40s and the 60s, so very likely uh, any information here contained is no longer proprietary. The patent has expired. Yeah. Likely. Very likely. I haven't done the research. I'm pretty sure. Um, but we're covered. We have, the, we have the donation agreement, so. Here's another one of these lovely... Uh, uh, colored just pencil drawing. Absolutely gorgeous. So this is uh, the Par Mill, and so using CNC, they created a milling machine, um, which you know you can see here is the drill bit. This was interchangeable, and um, this is the the real predecessor uh, to CNC, mm -hmm. and. Um, so you could program into this mill, that, or you could input the tape into this mill, and it would basically go around and be like, all right, you want a hole over here, and like this area needs to be recessed, and like over here you need a channel. And so it could mill out that shape yeah. without a human person <clears throat> having to basically drive the mill. Um, uh, Portico says at the time, <clears throat> 
patents were 17 years from issuance, so we're long past that. But um, it, it's making me think of like a modern like embroidery machine. Yeah. Uh, that will just go ahead and like do all the stitching for you. Yeah. Um, like that. And also have a player piano. Yep. I mean, there are a lot of technologies that saw this and were like, "Hey, that's pretty cool. Wouldn't it be neat if humans didn't have to do everything?" <laughs> You picked some of like the most gorgeous art, like. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do this whole stream just on like the industrial art. It's amazing. I I made a note. I'm I'm gonna see if I can get uh, an exhibit put together for the art and architecture library of just these. Oh, yeah. But if not, these will definitely be an exhibit that I do. Absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to put them in the exhibit downstairs, but I couldn't get my act together in time. So this one has a ghost in it, which is super exciting. I really love that. <laughs> um, I assume he was for scale, but also a ghost. Is it a warning? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because everything's green. I mean, it was, it was the 70s. It's very avocado. Maybe it's to do with Soylent because, um, you know, he's the ghost uh, because Soylent Green, uh, scale ghost, yes, Blue Rooster. Um, but here you can see iteration, that's the word I was looking for, or Did he iteration. Green screened out. Um, uh, Puddle you need extra points next time uh, I'm streaming from home. Um, so here's another iteration of this par tape drafting system, so you can Ooh. see here's a completed draft that's come out. Um, there's the input technology, here's a drafting table where whoever's working on it can, you know, sit and admire their work, and maybe this is the boss. The, the ghost, very helpful for me, because I had no concept of it being that big. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think he is there for scale. Like, there's this little plant and a ghost, and maybe this is the ghost of the supervisor, just making sure that everything is copacetic. Like, and I've seen pictures of the, like the IBM room-sized computers and things like that. And this is essentially the equivalent. I just, in the other picture, I didn't see it, it didn't as that it. large. Yeah. But again. But it was just the item. It wasn't even like placed in room. a scene. So, yeah, so this wow. Is a contextual picture to show like, here's how this will fit into your space. And also gorgeous. Yeah, very, very uh, modish. Um, so yeah, I just love, again, the artistry. They commissioned an artist to create this very functional piece to demonstrate their product. Mm -hmm. It has that, um, Uh, City of Tomorrow vibe. Uh, is that the term I want? I don't know. The, the whole like World's Fair, World of Tomorrow sort yeah. of that mid-century... Futurism. Yes, thank you. Futurism. Uh, design sort of... Aesthetic. Aesthetic. Which was in everything at the time. And I don't know. It just... It's just fun that it's also in this you know, very practical, like, manufacturing yeah. machine that's this, not, you know, this is not a commercially available product. And, and most people are never going to see it. Yeah, I've never seen one. <laughs> like, it, it would be used by the people who worked there, but, like, the public's not going to know that the machines people were working with are this pretty. Yeah. I like, I like that. They made be it pretty. Yeah, and, well, and the thing is, aesthetics matter, not just for sales. Like, yes. it making making your world more beautiful is not uh, is not a waste. Here we have a very '70s gentleman, um, and it's just demonstrating how this machine would operate. 
So you've got your blueprint and you've got your input keyboard and here you are plugging in your punch tape over here. Uh, disc storage, look at that. Ooh. Enormous. If you look at the size of this guy's head and the size mm -hmm. of that storage disc. Um, but it's just showing how this machine would be used sort of in context. And uh, these are actual physical pens that you put into the machine. And here it looks like you can do up to six different colors. And it'll just rotate whichever one is touching the paper and it'll scroll the paper by uh -huh. in order to create this drafted piece. So blueprints did not need to be hand drawn and drafted. I see the precursor to the seismometer. The modern, like, mm. yep. the paper with the pen, or uh, I don't know that it, that's the current mon uh, modern seismometer, but like, seismometer of like say 90s or whatever um, and this is a very interesting and instructional uh, piece of again industrial art mm -hmm. what I like the best and I don't know if this will communicate on camera very well but they used a metallic colored pencil to highlight the metal parts of the chair I can try and zoom in I don't know if it will I, yeah I, I don't know if the camcorder is capable of sort of capturing the metallic sheen. This is this is. I zoomed all the way in. Yeah. Uh, um. Let me let me zoom out just a titch yeah. to orient myself. There it is. Um, but that's what really caught my eye about this one is just the attention to detail of like, okay, we could just make this chair gray, but what if we made it shiny and gray? There. I just have to get the angle, the light angle right. Um, yeah. You can see the metallic sheen on the edges of the chair illustration. So somebody really took the time to create this representation. They were an artist. They were not just creating a, a throwaway piece of, you know, explanation material. They were creating a piece of art. And I love that. I think. Um, in the collections we've looked at in the past, the place that we've seen that the most is um, science communication with NASA-related stuff, because NASA hired artists all the time. Yeah. Uh, it still does. Um, it's nice to see it of this quality in a different setting. Yeah, and I mean, the context <clears throat> is super important. Um, some of these things, it's not it's not especially clear who exactly Hi, Phoenix Four. the audience was. <gasps> um, um, not a drawing of Exodus, no. These are, um, so we're looking at uh, materials from the John T. Parsons papers. Parsons um, was responsible for the creation of what is known today as um, com numerical control. Thank you, computer numerical control today. Uh, it was just numerical control then. But um, uh, basically, the foundation of all sorts of automation at, for manufacturing. Uh, yeah, I, I would totally hang this on my wall. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is obviously an exploded illustration. Um, I believe it's of a like propeller shaft housing for the Navy. Um, and it seems to have been drawn by D.E. Goodland. Um, but again, they've got the metallic sheen of these brass components in the art, and it's it's beautiful. And they did it on this lovely matte black paper. I just I get so delighted whenever they, one of these pops yeah, up. They're industrial design drawings for the purpose of like illustrating what the end product should look like and they don't they, they do not have to be this pretty and they would not be this pretty today but wow it's just amazing yeah and I mean, <laughs> if you 
you think about sort of the role that computers play in modern manufacturing, this would not be a hand-drawn item. No. This would be something that somebody made using a design software, um, which has its merits, but it doesn't have, again, that human input. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the same. And the fact that we still have these, one of the things that I both love and dislike about this collection is they kept everything. Like, they took pictures of everything. Mm. They kept all the memos, they kept all the documents. Um, and so some of those things, it's like, all right, do we really need 15 copies of this interdepartmental memo? Um, well, you never know. <laughs> but they also kept things like this, which was presumably, you know, they used it in one meeting with some Navy officer about, like, here's the housing we want to build for you. Do you want it or not? And, you know, it, it was not of extended utility that way, but it is gorgeous, and now we have it. Like, we have... We have drafting illustrations from architects, uh, especially like uh, in the International Archive of Women in Architecture. Uh, but even those don't approach how gorgeous these are. Yeah, these these are marvelous, and I'm very glad that they remained as part of the collection because they really do inform a lot of the way that Parson thought about and treated the items that they made. He was a very particular man, <laughs> um, very involved with his community when um, the city of Traverse City was looking to build a new hospital. He decided, just on his own, he was not on the board, he was not, he like knew a guy who was involved in the process, and he designed a whole wing of the hospital for them and like sent over a packet to be like here is how I think you should build your new hospital and it should be in a circle because I've done research and it's better for the nurses if it's in a circle because they don't have to walk as far and the city of Traverse City was like thanks <laughs> <laughs> for this we're gonna build a square hospital but this <clears throat> is cool um so we are at 4.30. We started about 14-ish minutes late. So I'm good to keep going for yeah, I mean, I'll talk about 15 this minutes or so. Want. Okay, I just wanted to check with you. Cause... Yeah, that's totally fine, I got nowhere to be. <laughs> and this is what I've been doing for the past year uh, by myself in a warehouse. <laughs> the only person I've been able to talk about it with so far is my partner, really. And so this is great, just being able to like info dump all of the cool stuff that I found over the past year. And it, we have it is awesome. Gorgeous illustration of one of these uh, part tape uh, drafting machines. You see this is the paper that it would be drafted onto and now it's got uh, this very fancy uh, minimalist touch screen sort of set up mm -hmm. uh, for the input rather than a whole big keyboard operation. So is this I mean, because this is again like late '60s. This is not a real touch screen. I, that was that was my question. You you no, got there. Uh, <laughs> no, this is not a real touch screen. It's basically like a film over the keys, so that it was um, less like a keyboard with buttons mm -hmm. and more like what you would do on your smartphone. It's still a button that you're hitting, but it's kind of like um, so old cell phones had that like rubber sheet. Over the buttons. So like a pressure sensitive surface, yeah. essentially? Okay. Um, and so you would input using that instead. So this is a later model of this part tape system. Which you can tell because now it's this lovely shade <clears throat> of khaki mm -hmm. as opposed to the avocado. Yeah. Oh, we might be in the 70s if it's khaki. Yeah. It's, yeah. Or... Heck, we could even be approaching. I mean, the lines still say 60s-ish, so khaki could be 80s, but the lines say 60s. <laughs> okay, we have to look at the um, the one with the divers before we end. Yes, the, yeah. the one with the divers is up next. Okay. <laughs> um, 
so uh, here they're showing basically how these blades are machined mm -hmm. and so there's this shaving device basically that do 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 goes along and cuts into the approximate shape mm -hmm. like as close as this machine can get it'll shave it down into the exact proportions and angles that it needs to be and then here you can see this is an illustration of that device that the guy was using in the photo to basically run to check along the shape the blade mm -hmm. to make sure that that shape is correct and then um, at this time all of the finishing would have been done by hand still so this machine would get it roughed out yep. to like pretty much where it needs to be and then a guy would come in and smooth it check it make sure that it's good to go so palm machining auto tool changing is palm would it have been palm wood is that what it's referring to do you know no i think palm was a guy ah okay um, <laughs> I was like, it, I, they're wooden blades, so I thought maybe, but okay. No, so I, basically what this person. is saying is you can interchange this cutting head mm -hmm. um, with any number of other cutting heads to get different sizes, shapes. You know, if you want to drill a hole, obviously that wouldn't work, so you can just switch out this head. Um, and that means that you can use this one machine to do the whole thing, unlike that uh, pure air stamping machine, which you would basically have to refit the entire thing in order to get it to do anything else. Mm -hmm. This is much more flexible, and this um, was much more workable for the way that manufacturing had to go once demand was raised and, you know, the exigencies of war. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's sort of the, the original CNC machine. It was just an NC machine, um, but that's what it did. And then, this is the first uh, one of these posters that I found in the collection. Um, and it's an illustration of how you could replace one of these propellers that they had made uh, while underwater. Uh, you know, in case you didn't want to uh, dry dock your boat in order to fix it, you can do it underwater again because of the interchangeability of all of these parts. And I just love these scuba divers that they have in here with his like uh, bolt gun, and they've got the crane lowering down this lovely propeller so that they can fit it onto the back of this ship. But yeah, this is the first one that I found and I was like, okay, I can get down with these. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is pretty cool. <laughs> it's such a simple drawing. Like, it, it's nowhere near as detailed as what we looked at before, but it's still... It's so evocative. Like, they didn't need to put this plant life yeah, in here. Like, this to me says quick sketch. Yeah, like, they, they didn't need to... But it's still scuba, so precise and so good. And it's lovely. <laughs> like, it, it's really a shame that this kind of artistry, this avenue for artists to work, has largely been lost. Um, you know, obviously there are digital artists. Well, that, but now we're starting to, like, something like this would probably be uh, an AI prompt. Uh, yeah. writer would be responsible for it. Yep. Um, so it, it's just really lovely that we still have this evidence of the role that art did play in, you know, even sort of the most technical, dry, like engineering heavy fields, they needed artists. And I think that that's lovely. And also there are scuba divers. I know. Who doesn't like scuba <laughs> divers? It's underwater. As oh. far as I know, the propellers were not orange. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe that's supposed to be like a bronze propeller or something. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly <clears throat> possible. Also, when you get a bunch of these uh, 
posters together, They're they heavy. get really freaking heavy. They're so heavy. <laughs> So Ooh. here, this was designed uh, to be sized down into a poster mm -hmm. that they could then use to advertise to the Navy. I'm going to read it. Yes. So. <clears throat> a propeller need no longer be just another machined casting. It can be and should be a highly engineered, precision manufactured, dynamic propulsion device to achieve optimum ship performance, maximum crew comfort and safety. By adopting Parsons system, the US Navy can lead the world in the marine propeller field. I enjoy reading old ads. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just get such a kick out of this one because like, and again, you've got the- uh, The, the patent copyright and patent stamp. stamp yeah. Down here in the bottom. But, like, you don't advertise to the Navy. <laughs> well, apparently you does. do. Is this watercolor? Yes. Uh, uh, watercolor color pencil and, and watercolor. Color pencil. And it looks like a uh, permanent marker as well uh, for the writing. Well, yeah, for the, the writing, words. definitely, and, and the lining on the, uh, the submarine. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe they ever got into manufacturing submarines, but they did do parts for submarines. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, in the exhibit downstairs, there is a plan for basically an extendable submarine where each section was made individually and you could kind of stick as many together as you want, like Legos. So you could make a okay. longer or a shorter submarine and you know each of those components it was like modular yeah and so it could be like these ones are crew cabin and you can have four of those and then these ones are you know research and you can have three of those yeah so you could make an extendable summary and it all riveted together and all the pieces fit and then you would have your nose cone and your tail cone submarine it, it took me a minute to get there but yeah because each section would be would have bulkheads separating it anyway yeah. uh, in order to control uh, pressure and well water coming on board if there was a, a problem so yeah there's no reason it couldn't just be modular sections bolted together yeah it, it, again, huh. it's, it's unclear if they ever actually got to the production stage but there are drawings for this uh, submarine that Parsons was proposing. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring, but I didn't think we would have enough time for it, uh, after Parsons left the Parsons Corporation and started the John P. Parsons Company, which uh -huh. is a little confusing, um, he got really into keyboards, and so he developed, it like was called the Nimble Keyboard. Music keyboards or no, typing keyboards? like typing keyboards, okay. input keyboards. Um, he got really into, and so he developed his own, like, uh, non-standard keyboard format for inputting. <clears throat> so, instead of QWERTY. Instead of QWERTY, uh, and we have, like, a wood model that he made of this keyboard. I will... I have it. I have it at the warehouse. I, I thought we probably wouldn't have time for it. I wanted to focus on the Parsons Corporation stuff you're, versus the. Parsons you're fine. I'm just going to make a note so that I can do, at some point, something about that. Probably a blog post or something. But yeah, there's a lot of um, stuff about his nimble keyboard uh, work uh, in the collection. There's like a whole sub series about it. I would suggest you do the blog post, but. Um, you're moving on. Yes, I'm out so of time. So <laughs> I'm making notes for myself because I think this is fascinating. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I love talking about it. It's a great collection. Um, here we can see, again, just another uh, propeller blade in process. And you can see sort of how it's being milled out. So is this actually shaving it down or are they uh, texturing it? They're shaving it down. Okay. Um, 
because as you can see here, this is sort of where they're testing it. It needs to be smooth. So this machine is for taking off kind of big chunk chunks. And they can get it to, you know, pretty much the right dimensions. And then they can come through and like clean it down to make it nice and smooth and aerodynamic. Um, but they did this with metal, they did this with wood, they experimented with various different like resins and Plastics. fibers Plastic and all kinds of things yeah. just to be like, can we make a better one? Can we make one that has these particular traits uh, that we're looking for? Um, I mean, I'm sure today they probably do like carbon fiber and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's great. There are a million of these posters. Not all of them are uh, entirely interesting. Um, here's another one that was meant for advertising purposes for these propellers. Ooh. Yeah. Parsons, manufacturing system for marine propellers. Compete on price with foreign competition. Excel in quality. Reduce pattern cost, molding cost, setup cost. Profiling cost, hub facing cost, surface finishing cost, handling cost, work in process time. The John T. Parsons Company, Traverse City, Michigan. I'm not sure if that's profiling cost or profiling cost. It uh, looks like profiling. Yeah, it, it does say profiling. Um, I imagine that's a typo. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I read it as profiling because that made sense to me, but uh, it's also possible that profiling is a thing that I just don't know exists. Uh, it's not a process that I've heard of, so <laughs> okay. I think that's probably a typo. Um, Excellent. Again, this was made to be resized into more of like a, a smaller poster size. You know, they can take a picture of it, size it down, print it out. Um, I believe Excel also only has one L. Uh, generally. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but... Uh, a lot of things that in American English only have one L have two L's in British English. That's true, but he was American. Um, his I am too, British. but I spell the British way most of the time. <laughs> With that, just because uh, I think that's how it's supposed to be spelled, and then I get confused. My favorite part of this poster is that this logo is also hand-drawn. Like, this wasn't a stamp that they put on. This was somebody drew this for the purposes of the poster. And, I mean, it's those little details that just really get me. Well, yeah, and like, uh, today, somebody would design this in, uh, well, um, it depends on which software you have, the, have access to, but um, it's some sort of page layout software, uh, somebody would, put this together and, and they would the just logo. grab the logo and put it on and and then save it as as like a PDF or something and and send it off to be printed multiple times but they had to hand draw it and then reduce it and they had to draw it at a larger scale so that they could get the detail that they wanted yeah and you know make it look really nice. I just love it. <laughs> it's a great collection. Everybody it, should come see it. It is awesome. Uh, sure. Show one more. Oh, here, here's I was looking to see who was around that we might want to pop in on. Okay, so uh, here is the Pure Air Kitchen. And again, this is a hand-drawn artist rendering. Is this of, a slide? No, it's, okay, sorry, um, go ahead. So these doors and lines, it's like a transparency layer over the top. Um, it's just the, the tape on the outer edges made, reminded me of um, the glass slide collections that we have, because that's uh, how those are held together as well. This would be a very big slide. I know, that, I was very <laughs> intrigued. <laughs> but it's not. So 
but yeah, like again, this is one that I would want on my wall. It's it's so beautiful, it's so detailed. Somebody took a lot of time to make this look perfect for this design. Um, it's unclear what the purpose of. It might have been for an advertisement. It might have been for like some kind of internal presentation or external presentation. It has a lot of design elements to it that remind me of um, mid-century like frigid air. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they were pulling on a lot of the same things. It's a lot of those rounded corners. It's I mean, well, and even the spelling, uh, pure air, A I R E. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they called it that again because it had that internal circulatory system. People thought that it was bad for you to have like smoke and smells lingering in your house after you cook. And so this would suck it all out and shoot it outside and you would just have your pure, clean, uh, uh, leaded gas <laughs> and smog air because there was no EPA. Um, but you know, people were concerned about the lived environment inside of their homes. Mm -hmm. And so this was, sort of an advertising tactic that they took to try to address that fear within the market of like, oh, we can we can keep your family safe. We can make sure that, you know, the home inside of you or the air inside of your home is pure for your family. Housewife who lives inside of their house exclusively. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, ultimately, obviously, this is not a design that caught on in the larger commercial market, but it was very successful for quite some time. It's amazing. I am very, very happy that you uh, asked about bringing this stuff <laughs> to show off because um, I wouldn't know about this. Yeah, it's, Otherwise. it's very unusual in an industrial collection to have this much humanity and this much beauty. Usually they're much more dry, technical. Obviously there are areas of interest within them, but they don't have this much art. So it's really been a treat to get to work with all of this beautiful stuff in addition to you know, the more technical documents, mm -hmm. the more involved texts to just have these little pieces of art interspersed throughout has just been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we should probably wind down. <laughs> so, of course, uh, that's going to mean that we're going to be looking at the sides again, but um, you know, only because I didn't swap video on um, this scene. Uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> so thank you everybody for joining today for Archival Adventures. Um, I enjoy doing this every Wednesday. I'm glad that some of you stop by regularly. Um, <clears throat> Archivist Bess, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for coming on the show and, and bringing this wonderful collection to share. Um, I, I have ideas now for exhibits and blog posts and I'm, I'm excited. So thank you. Um, Anytime, happy to do it. Thanks for having me. This has been wonderful. Um, so let me see where we're gonna head. Also, uh, next week uh, on the 20th of September, um, we will be doing the High Energy Physics Series. I know High Energy Physics Series is supposed to be the last Wednesday of each month, but it will be the last stream in September. Uh, so I'm doing it because um, I took off the last week of September, so there won't be a stream on the 27th. But uh, next week, we'll be looking at the, um, the James Robbins Randolph papers. Um, 
I don't know a whole lot uh, because most of the time the show is me looking at things that I've never seen before. Uh, the abstract says, papers of engineer, mathematician, and physicist James Robbins Randolph, including notes, calculations, correspondence, and writings. I know it's one box. Um, so we're going to explore that and learn together. He was born in 1891 and taught physics uh, and was a physicist as early as the 20s. So uh, that's what we'll be looking at next week. Um, as for where we're going to go, I think if they will accept raids, I think we'll be raiding over to NASA, um, who currently are streaming uh, some stuff about the OSIRIS-REx uh, mission. Um, let's see, it says uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, mission previews asteroid sample return with open space. So I don't know whether NASA's channel accepts raids, We'll find out. Um, but thank you all so much for joining. I'm, I'm going to see if raiding is possible. Looks like they do, so that's where we're going to go. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I hope I see you again soon. Uh, until I do, uh, keep enjoying history. Keep exploring history. See you later. Um. <laughs>